afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us in the Spouting Off area. My name's Beck, I'm one of the Wellfest volunteers. I'm about to introduce you to the amazing Ingrid Visser. Before I do that, I just want to point out to you, you've got little feedback forms on your chairs, these little tiny things. We know that Ingrid's going to be an amazing speaker, so when you get to the end of the talk, if you think she's as amazing as we do, you just give a little tear on the feedback form next to the fantastic five-star mark. If you're some kind of evil, nasty person and you don't like Ingrid, you can give a little tear at the bottom on the one-star thing and then we'll just throw those forms away, okay? So, I'm going to now, with great pleasure, hand you over to Ingrid Visser. And I'm not going to say any more because she's just an introduction in herself. Ingrid. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Uh, so, I was asked if I could do a 10-minute summary on orca in captivity. And I'm like, good Lord, where do I even start? 10-minute summary? Not a chance. So I talked them and conned them and pleaded them into giving me 20 minutes. So even this is just, I'm going to have to go pretty fast. But, you know, for me, it, it's, it's been a journey for me. And it was something that any of you that were at Blackfish last night, you heard Will Travers talking about that. It's a journey that we all go on. And mine has been relatively new. I mean, I've really only strongly been involved in the captivity, anti-captivity industry um, for the last 15 years, really. So I wanted to tell you about a couple of the orca that I've been involved with and how I got involved in and what happened there. But all of them obviously have their tale to tell. And the first orca that I saw in captivity were in marine land on Thebes in France. And it was in 2000, it was the year I finished my PhD thesis. I'd only ever seen orca in the wild, and I went to this place. And I literally threw up. I was that devastated about what I saw. I had nightmares, I cried myself to sleep, I couldn't believe what I had seen. And I was so horrified by it, that I completely shut it out of my mind. I didn't want to deal with it, I didn't want to know about it. And I went back to doing my research. And I spoke about captivity, but it was a very general thing. I really wasn't speaking out for an individual animal. I was just saying, it's nasty, it's horrible, don't go there, you know. But it, it, wasn't, it wasn't something that was really close to my heart. And I, I did my best to ignore it because I just couldn't deal with it. And then I got involved with Keiko. And I was very, very fortunate to work with him and help him release him back out into the wild. And I only got to do this for a couple of months in 2000 and a couple of months in 2001. But it was really pivotal for me. And I, and I got to meet him as an individual who had gone on his own journey. And, and yet still, I wasn't ready to take that big step and be standing in front of the public in a forum like this and be shouting, you know, free Morgan. And, if any of you saw me yesterday running up on the stage and doing all sorts of silly things like that. But in 2000, again, the same year uh, that I'd been working with Keiko, I was on this great big pilgrimage to go and see orca around the world in different places because I'd finished my PhD. And I went to Argentina and I saw the orca coming up on the beach taking sea lions. Now, I knew that there was an orca in captivity in Argentina, but I didn't go and see him. I didn't even know his name, but I knew he was in there. But in March 2006, I bit the bullet and I said, right, I'm going to see this animal. He's come from the population that I'm studying in Argentina, that I've helped set up a research project. I need to know more about this individual. So I went to Mundo Marino in Argentina in March 2006. And this is the tank that Shemink is in. That's it. That's the show tank. That's the big tank. That's when he gets let out of his little prison into the big one this tiny little box, and I was just in tears. I could hardly take photographs. Mundo Marino translates to Marine World. It's in San Clemente, and it's not far from Buenos Aires. It's about a six hour drive. There's not any real easy public transport to get there, so I hired a taxi driver to take me there. Uh, we went for just one day, but in that one day, it really hit hard. But I still wasn't ready to speak out publicly. And I got involved with a couple of NGOs, and we wrote some articles, and we had a non diplume or a, a pseudonym, a name that I was writing under. I didn't use my own name. 
because I was afraid that that was going to affect my research. And so many scientists are bullied by other scientists into being branded as activists if we speak out. And I was afraid. I didn't have the guts. So Portia Mink didn't really have a scientist to speak out for him. There were a lot of lobbyists and there were some scientists who were starting to make a lot of noise about it, but it certainly wasn't me. So Shemink was 24 years in that tank alone, and Earth Island Institute, who had been involved with helping Keiko, they got involved, and also some local organisations in Argentina, including Wild Earth, and they really started making some inroads. And the stuff that I was doing in the background was just inconsequential. It, it had absolutely no impact. It made me feel okay, but it wasn't making a difference in the world. And just to put it into perspective for you, that's Shemank's tank up there on the, with the big arrow beside it. That's the one he's locked in for about 23 hours of the day. He's let out into the show tank uh, for about an hour a day. In the show tank, uh, the tank is actually smaller than it really looks because it's got this ledge around the edge and the ledge and the sides of the tank are typically very filthy and these were the sort of photographs that I was taking and I was passing them on to others so that others could do the work. Again, I still didn't have the guts to stand up and, and add my voice to this uh, atrocity that's going on and speak out. Now those that were involved in Argentina, they managed to get a ban put on Shemink being moved out of Argentina because SeaWorld wanted to move Shemink into the US. So they managed to get this ban put in place so that he couldn't be moved to the US. And that was really important. It was a, a big change in the laws in Argentina and it basically meant that, that um, SeaWorld couldn't use him for breeding. And then the Liberate Shemink movement really started to get quite active. And then by 2013, I'd been back a couple of times to see Shemink, and I really started to make some active voice with um, what was going on there. I've been invited by the Argentinian government to come and give some presentations, and uh, we're working very closely with the aquarium themselves. These guys are actually willing to do things. Not big steps yet, it's baby steps, but they are doing some things. So for instance, in the right-hand corner of the frame there, you can see this edge of a blue box. That's a huge speed and they play music that is so loud that I can't stand in the stadium without sticking my fingers in my ears. And yet this is right beside his tank and it verberates through his tank and he tail lobs like this when they start the music because he just, it, it drives him nuts. So we talked to them and we said, listen guys, the very simple minimum thing that you can do is get rid of those friggin' speakers. And they did. So at least Shemink doesn't have the music in his ears all the time. We are talking to them about some options with sea pens. Unfortunately, the area where he was captured doesn't have a good coastline for putting sea pens, but we're looking at alternative areas and we are talking with them. But um, also, unfortunately, SeaWorld is talking with them and SeaWorld managed to uh, train Shemek for artificial uh, collection of a sperm, basically masturbating him. They collected the sperm, they shipped it to the US, they did artificial insemination on a female orca called Kasatka from Iceland and Kasatka has had a calf. And there are rumours that there is another orca at the moment that's pregnant with Shemek's sperm. So in many respects, SeaWorld has won. We are at the moment trying to help uh, push through legislation in Argentina to stop the sperm being exported as well. And Tilikim, many of you know his story. Uh, I was very unfamiliar with it. And, and again, you know, just, just wanted to remain ignorant because I didn't want my bubble burst about how wonderful these animals were and what was going on in these aquariums. And it wasn't until uh, Dawn Branchow was killed and I was contacted by OSHA, the Occupational Health and Safety in the US, and I was asked to prepare, prepare an affidavit for the court case on what it is that was going on with me swimming with orca in the wild and how come I've never been attacked or never seen any aggression, yet they have hundreds of records of aggression in captivity. And um, I wasn't... It, I wasn't required in the courtrooms like Naomi was and, and um, a whole lot of others. So uh, they just used mine and his background information. But that really got me thinking about what was going on. And it was about this time that I really started getting active in the movement.
And the, the tipping point for me was when SeaWorld said nothing would change for Tilikum. Those were the words that did it for me. I can remember the exact moment I heard that on TV. I got goosebumps and I gasped and I said, you ignorant fools, you pig-headed ignorant fools. What do you think you're doing? Can you not understand why this happened? and somebody needed to speak out. And so I had joined my small voice to those of Naomi, who's been doing this for years, Sam Berg, who's here today and, and is involved in Blackfish. And I just hope that amongst all of us that we can um, help get you guys to broadcast this message out further. So Tilikim is approximately seven meters long. This is the size of the tank that he's kept in most of the time. And they let him out to do shows, and then he's shoved back in there. Now, they do say that he's not kept in the medical tank that much anymore, um, but he can be put into a slightly larger tank, which is, wow, a whopping 21 metres long. So it's three times the size instead of less than, t less than half. Uh, less than twice, sorry. So, you know, again, it doesn't matter what size you put these animals in, the tanks are still too small. And then I was involved again with Sam uh, with a court case which was called the 13th Amendment filing. And it was basically about the slavery of these animals and it involved Tilikim and four other orca. And what we were trying to do was just get people thinking about the fact that these animals shouldn't be used as slaves. And as part of that, and I met and got involved quite heavily with an a organisation called the Orca Network and a wonderful man called Howard Garrett. And he asked me to be involved with another court case that was involved for an orca called Lolita. And Lolita has been in this tank for 44 years, 34 of those alone, and that's it. What you see is what she gets. There's no other tank. It's not like Shemin Cortilicum where they can move her into another one. This is it. Barely able to stand upright or hang upright in the water. Um, barely able to swim around in part of the tank. It's absolutely disgusting. And in the 1970s, 70 orca, nearly 70 orca, were taken from the Pacific. And those orca, um, she's one of them. And so the hope is now that there's, there's some moves afoot to be able to return Lolita back to the wild. If not back to the wild, then certainly back to the coast in a sea pen where she can feel the ocean again. There's a wonderful documentary that's out there that's called Lolita Slave to Entertainment. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's really good and it very explains very well Lolita's plight. And again, you know, it's only recently for me that I've had, had the courage to step forward and, and go in and see her. And in June 2013, I, I managed to raise enough money and I flew to the United States and I went in specifically to see Lolita. And it was just devastating, absolutely devastating. And I went with a colleague of mine, Daniel Azarian, who has been campaigning for Lolita for a number of years. And Daniel, like me, had never even seen Lolita, but had been speaking out for her. So Daniel and I went together. And Daniel is a filmmaker. And he makes predominantly short public announcement films and advertisements and stuff like that. And he had already made one for Lolita. And I said to him, well, I think that we should make another one. And I think you and I should be on camera and be talking about it. And we filmed Daniel and we filmed me. And in the end, um, he edited it, so I'm the only one in it. Um, but we, we saw the travesty that was going on. At the moment, this is um, the only place in the US where there's water work going on, where they're, where they're riding the animals. Uh, and the, the, the little PSA that Daniel put together is called A Day in the Life of Lolita. It's on YouTube and it's spreading pretty fast and it's being nominated for a couple of short film uh, nom uh, awards in the US. So we're hopeful that that will help raise its profile. And then of course Morgan. On the 23rd of June 2010, Morgan was captured and as soon as she was captured, uh, we knew what was going to happen. We predicted it. Uh, I've got diary writings from back then saying, you know, this is, this is not looking good. We know what's going to happen. SeaWorld's going to get their grubby little mitts on this orca and, and it'll, that'll be the end of her. And sure enough, that's what's happened. Uh, she was shipped to an aquarium in the Netherlands where her tank is, is basically, well, was for her then, um, not even two times her size.
And at that stage, it was the smallest tank that an orca was being kept in. And she would just float there listlessly for hours on end. Uh, she had nothing to do all day. And she was kept in there for 18 months. Then, uh, during this whole process, we had an alternative for her. We had been into Stow in Norway. We had found sea pens. You can actually see them in the bottom left down here that we could put Morgan in so that she could at least be in the ocean. But the aquarium refused to do this. Uh, they said that, that it was not a viable option and they wouldn't even try it. And so we've been involved in a number of different court cases for Morgan and we hope to get the results from that on the 2nd of April. So Morgan has now been shipped to Loro Parque in Spain. That's her on the left. And uh, she's performing. She's performing pretty much every day. And she comes out and does a 15 minute show once a day. But the rest of the time, like to the Kim, uh, she's locked in a medical tank. And this is the medical tank up here. And it's 10 meters shorter, 10 meters shorter than the Dutch tank. Now the reason she was shipped out of the Netherlands was because the tank was too small. Now, Ola at the back is going to give you a wave, okay? So we've measured from this wall over here to Ola, that's the length of the tank, and from Ola to the wall is the length of the tank. Now, Alex is not going to jump up on chair. That's the length of Morgan from the wall to Alex. So that's the tank that Morgan is being kept in 75% of the day. <coughs> Now we know that she's being kept in there 75% of the day because we have people in undercover. We've got spies out there and Loro Parque knows it, but they still ignore it. They still keep her locked up. The trainers typically ignore her. I was there the other day and watched her for a number of hours that they didn't know that I was watching. Um, and she's just locked in the medical tank. No attention, no food, nothing to do, no toys. Nothing locked in that box, solitary confinement. And when she's out of the tank, if she's not in her 15 minutes of the show, she's being kept with the adult males. And this is her line there, and that's Keto, the adult male in the background. And Keto appears in Blackfish. He is the male orca that killed Alexis Martinez. So they are trying to breed Morgan with a known killer. So what I'm going to ask you all here today, oh, we've all been saying it, we will continue to say it. Take a pledge, don't buy a ticket. The only reason these places exist is because they have people's money. They can get money from people to go and see these shows. 